um, I am going to talk about all the tick-borne diseases in, uh, in the state of Maine um, and what we can do to protect ourselves from them. Um, if you've been reading the newspaper, other than COVID, um, Lyme, Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases continue to hog the news, uh, even despite the pandemic, it's as if there isn't enough to worry about. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to be uh, talking about, the, the good news is that there are ways that you can avoid infect, infection, um, and I'm going to be talking about different ways to, un, to implement these various precautions. You'll, you may be seeing these signs in various places around the island. Okay, so if you take your precautions, uh, you can absolutely avoid infection. Uh, and it's not as if just one thing will do it. Typically, you have to uh, pursue several different avenues of prevention, similar to the ways that we avoid uh, getting COVID. Uh, generally, there's not one thing that will prevent, prevent infection, but there's if you do a variety of things, you'll be able to stay safe. Um, so, Lyme disease is the most common tick disease in Maine, and it unfortunately has been reported in residents in all counties in Maine as of the last few years. This, this figure here shows the different, uh, different levels of, of infectivity and the number of people who have gotten, uh, gotten Lyme disease. The highest rates are here in the mid-coast area. Um, uh, our county, um, uh, Sagadahawk is, is down here, and we are no longer the absolute highest, but this whole, basically the entire coastline is a very high risk uh, tick zone. And uh, Lyme disease affects all age groups. Uh, and it, it, this, this figure shows uh, over time uh, the, the age groups that are most likely to uh, acquire Lyme disease. And the highest rates here is actually the kids who are 5 to 14, followed by people who are 65 or older. Um, again, any, anybody gets it. And the only, the really, I think the only reason why uh, these age groups are more likely to get it is that these age groups are more likely to spend more time out in the woods. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how to get Lyme disease, and it's pretty easy. If you spend any time outdoors in Maine, especially on the mid-coast, you will be exposed to ticks. Even the islands are very, have very high, high uh, rates of infection. Uh, so where is actually the best place to find ticks? Uh, actually, it's in your backyard. Um, the tick lab in Maine, they, they uh, studied all of the ticks that people pulled off of themselves in the past year and sent in to be examined, and it turned out that most of them were uh, found after people were gardening or doing yard work, walking, followed by walking, playing, doing sports, trapping, logging, camping, bicycling. The only pattern is if you're out and about and you're in the woods and you're not taking precautions, you're probably going to get it. Um, the important thing to know is that about half of the, t of the deer ticks in Maine are infected with Lyme disease. That's really important to know because that means if you get one bite, the chance in one, in one tick that's stuck on you, that, that there's a good chance that you actually will get the disease. So the odds are very much against you. 8% uh, carry another tick-borne disease called anaplasmosis. 6% carry a different one called babesiosis. And if you're lucky, you'll have a tick that ha carries both of them. And that's what I happen to have encountered. Um, now, where else can you find ticks? Um, you can find ticks on your legs, on your torso, on your head and arms, on your groin, on your neck. Um, and again, this is also based uh, from the ticks that people pulled off of them most recently. Um, this is not terribly specific. The lesson here is that you can actually, uh, the, the ticks wander, will wander around your body once they find you, and they will search for a place to tuck in and, and, and bite. We'll get more to how you actually can, can be more strategic about, about uh, finding ticks. Now, deer ticks, they need a damp, humid environment to survive. Uh, they're arachnids, so, so think like a spider. They like moisture. 
So you'll, in the woods, you'll find them in wooded areas and wooded edges, leaf litter, low ground cover, again, places that retain moisture. Uh, ticks do not hop like fleas. They crawl. And they are usually picked up when you're walking on the lower leg, and they tend to crawl up the body looking for a place to attach and feed. Now, ticks, uh, they tend to attach, they'll attach to your clothing if you're wearing clothing, and then they'll crawl upward. So they'll, they'll find your, your sock, your shoe, your pants leg, then they'll crawl upward until they find a nice, moist, protected place to hide. So when you're doing a, chick, a tick, check uh, after you've been outside, you want to you make sure you pay attention to any place where you're, you're sweaty, moist areas like your armpits, behind your knees, your navel, behind your ears, skin folds, and also in your hair because, again, they tend to be moist. Um, so things to know about deer ticks is that they are pervasive most of the year. Um, again, most of them are infected with one or more serious diseases. And if you don't take precautions, you will get infected. And I can't tell, I can't say that enough because uh, you, know, you you just don't want to take any chances. Um, the problem is getting worse. Uh, generally, uh, generally, most in over time there there are the the tick situation is generally getting getting worse. And I say that generally because just last year we actually had a little bit of a downtick, um, no pun intended, but that was probably because we had an extraordinarily dry uh, summer and we, and also people weren't reporting things so much because of the COVID pandemic. Now, I just want to show you sort of what's going on that nationally. Um, Lyme disease, which, which is represented by each blue, a blue dot, each blue dot represents an individual case of Lyme disease. It's, and this was in 2001. You can see here's Maine, hardly anything happening in Maine, maybe a little bit in the southern southern coastal areas, but really nothing up here. And if you just go over time, 2011, look, this whole area is blue. And this is the most recent data that we have. And look, I mean, uh, the entire coast is wiped out, you know, in blue, which again, so many cases, and it's extending north. And this is probably because of climate change. Um, and that the, the, the cold is not enough to kill the ticks during the winter um, and, and other factors. Okay, so lesson one, avoid deer ticks. Um, easier said than done, how to avoid deer ticks. So before you go outdoors, dress. you have to dress smart. Uh, and that means uh, it, it, whatever clothes you're wearing, uh, treat them treat their clothes and your gear with this permethrin uh, or buy pre-treated items to repel ticks. Tuck in your pants and shirts to keep them out. Don't wear sandals. Uh, use EPA registered insect repellents on exposed skin. Uh, when outdoors, try to avoid the ticks by avoiding grassy, bushy, wooded areas where ticks may be found. And if you're on a trail, just stay in the middle of the trail. Just avoid brushing against tall grass. If you're biking on the roads, just try to avoid having your legs or arms brush up against uh, grass or bushes um, because that's where the ticks will, will be sitting. And we'll go, we'll, we'll, you'll learn more about where, where the ticks like to sit. After you come indoors, you want to check your clothing for ticks and you want to put your clothes in the dryer for about 10 minutes, not the washer, in the dryer because uh, moisture will not kill the ticks when they like moisture, but if you put them in the dryer, they will dry out. They don't, they really, ticks do not do well with being dried out. Um, and then as soon as you get back in, as soon as you can, shower and do a thorough tick check. Again, looking for places where ticks might be hiding. And if you see an attached tick, you want to remove it immediately and properly so you don't actually infect yourself. Um, and also take steps to prevent ticks in your pets in your yard. And this summarizes what we're going to talk about in the next 30 minutes, okay? And these slides are going to be available uh, afterwards, so I'm going to uh, go, go quickly over some of these um, so you, you can re review them at your leisure later. Okay, so um, it's not just about Lyme disease. Deer ticks carry and transmit a number of viruses, bacteria, and protozoa that cause diseases that can kill you or cause you serious harm. And there are no vaccines, and you don't get immunity after you get them. So you can get reinfected with any of these as long as you choose. Okay, this is showing 
uh, anaplasmosis, not, not only Lyme disease has been increasing, but all of the other tick-borne diseases have been rising almost exponentially. And the com most common tick-borne diseases in Maine are Lyme disease, again, anaplasmosis, uh, and babesiosis. Uh, uncommon diseases, but that are still happening um, and that, that are carried also by the same tick, the same, the same deer tick. Uh, Powassan disease, uh, there were only three cases. It's, I, I can't, couldn't find very much recent data on these. I think the pandemic has been swamping our CDC. Um, there's another type of Lyme disease, uh, Borrelia miyamotoi. It's like Lyme disease, but worse, with no rash. Um, and there have been basically a handful of cases. So these are these are on the horizon. They're out there, but they're not very common. Uh, Ehrlichiosis, again, a handful of cases, spotted uh, spotted fever. Um, uh, basically Rocky Mountain spotty, spotted fever. And there's a few new ones that are also heading our way. Basically, just again, with climate change, you know, we're, we're seeing things that did not used to tolerate the main weather are tolerating it now and, and, th and thriving and increasing. So there's, you know, the, these are the main ones to worry about, but the, the exact, what will protect you from Lyme disease will also protect you from these other diseases. So that's the good, good news. Okay, now, um, Lyme disease is common. Um, it, re it resembles, the symptoms resemble a viral syndrome. It feels somewhat like having a cold. Um, many, many people will have a rash, uh, even though it's not always detected. M the majority do not actually remember having a tick bite. That's the problem. Uh, we'll learn why. Um, most people recover rapidly and completely with antibiotics. Uh, the antibiotics, the sooner, you, the sooner you treat it, the less you suffer and the faster you'll recover. Uh, treatment is, is typically uh, for, for uh, early, early uncomplicated disease. It, you know, it's about you know, 14, 10 to 14 days, um, and, but it's longer depending on if it's picked up early or later. Uh, if it's untreated, it can spread beyond the skin uh, through the blood, and 60% and will get arthritis. Um, the knee is a typical site. 10% will have neurological problems, and 5% will have it'll affect the heart, uh, causing the heart to go much slower than it should. Uh, and this just gives you an idea about the, the type of symptoms. Um, the most common symptom of Lyme disease is rash, followed by joint pain, neurologic sy uh, uh, symptoms, and cardiac symptoms. Um, and this is shown for the most recent uh, time that our CDC reports um, that 3% uh, of patients with Lyme disease were hospitalized. 15% already had it an, an earlier time. And this probably means if you're a main guide, you're doing a lot of outdoor stuff and you got it once, chances are, you know, you're probably going to pick it up again unless you really take a lot of precautions. Um, and uh, only 36% reported uh, that they were bitten by a tick because the ticks, again, often they go in places you don't see them, you don't feel them, uh, they fall off and you don't know, and then you may miss the rash if the rash is in your, in your, on your scalp or somewhere else. So these symptoms that are here, it's, they're often hard to see because of, again, the, the ticks like to go into the dark, wet Netherlands, uh, where you're not actually, uh, it's, it's easy to be undetected. Um, okay, and I mentioned there are other, the other common diseases here, tick-borne disease, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and I put Powassan virus out here as well. Um, the, these are the range of symptoms that, that they can present with. There's not a single one that says, uh, aha, you know, I have a headache. Oh, it must be Lyme disease. I mean, headache, joint aches, muscle aches, fatigue, no appetite. I mean, how many people experience that any, any particular day? So, you know, these are a lot of what we call nonspecific symptoms. Um, so it's basically, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard diagnosis for clinicians to make if you don't happen to have a characteristic rash. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the other thing that's particularly problematic, about 20% of people with Lyme disease will present with a fever, and that's very challenging in, during the COVID uh, pandemic because somebody comes down with a fever, uh, the immediate thought is not Lyme disease. The immediate thought, of course, is COVID, um, so it results in a lot of, um, uh, 
other other stress uh, that, that 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 would normally not be there. So in, again, another reason to take take precautions. Um, again, the rash. I want to talk a little bit about the rash because most of you have probably heard about the Lyme rash, and again, it, it is the most commonly reported symptom. Uh, uh, and it begins at the site of the tick bite um, three to 30 days after you've been bitten. And it usually grows in size for several days. Again, it's often in the armpit, groin, behind the knees, belt line, navel, again, because these are moist places. It's not painful. It's not itchy. It's not warm. And it gradually expands. So what you do, uh, I'm going to show you a picture. So this is when it's already expanded. What you do is you get a if you if you have a funny rash, what you do is you get a you get a sharpie marker. Uh, do I have one to show you? Your typical sharp sharpie marker, and you just go you mark around the outer perimeter of where that rash is, and then you check it. And if in a few hours later this mar this rash is marching out and expanding. That's that's highly suspicious for it being Lyme disease. Now again, they don't start out looking like this. They start out they start out as a as a as a small you know a, a very small little red rash, completely red, and then it'll gradually expand. And it doesn't start to have that central clearing until after it's gotten to a certain size. Um, so you really the the best way to figure out if that's what you got is when you have anything that's small uh, and you're worried just just mark mark the the outside with a sharpie and then check it and if it's if it's growing just marches bigger and bigger and bigger uh, and that's there's not much else that does that and it's not painful that's that's and that's it. Um, uh, it, but you know the they call it a bullseye. It doesn't really look like a bullseye to me. Um, and and there's all sorts of variants of it. Look at this. I mean, this is something that's gotten really big. This is spread, you know. Um, and and if you miss that first rash, which often it's missed, then then you you can get the disseminated rash, and which which is when you have multiple of these lesions that that appear. And that's when often uh, you know you have it's 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 later disease where you may also have some arthritis and other symptoms because now you're talking about you know it has been untreated for a while um i i get a lot of people sending me pictures of their rashes asking me is this uh is this lyme disease um couple, just a couple of things to remember about a lyme rash is that it's flat it's not painful or itchy most Spider bites are really common if you're out, out outdoors. Spider bites are painful, um, and they often have a little black spot in the middle. Um, other other inse insect bites, it raised. Um, they're raised and itchy. So again, it's the the Lyme rash. It's completely flat. There's no there's no swelling. There's no blistering, and it doesn't hurt, and it doesn't itch, and it doesn't feel warm to the touch like others. There's nothing. You know, there's there's nothing else going on, and so if you have, so if you if you if it hurts, you don't have to worry, for the most part. Um, somebody asked me about this alpha gal uh, syndrome, um, and this is um, something I think has been in the news intermittently. Um, basically, it's a it's a severe allergic reaction to and to to red meat and to other products that 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 contain um, uh, alpha-gal, uh, which is basically anything that is made from uh, products uh, that, that are from, from mammals, um, so like cosmetics, some medications, some vaccines, gelatin. And this, this, this funny thing, I mean, it's nothing funny, it's a very serious allergic reaction. Um, uh, it's basically uh, something that's found in the saliva of certain types of ticks, and one of those ticks is a deer tick. It's also uh, found in the Lone Star tick. So, so far, everything I've been talking about has been in the deer tick, except this alpha-gal thing is also in the Lone Star tick. Now, Lone Star tick used to not be in Maine, but now it's in Maine. Um, it's not terribly common here in Maine, but again, it's becoming becoming more common. And well, well, I'll show you what a, what what these two different ticks look like uh, very soon. Okay, so let's talk about tick identification. Um, this is a deer tick, not a real one. Uh, it's also called the black-legged tick, uh, Ixodes scapularis. Um, but again, I, most people here refer to it as the deer tick because 
that's its primary host. Here's what it looks like on somebody's finger. This is an adult and this is a nymph, okay? Different sizes. Doesn't, it, fairly nondescript, number four legs, um, and it's got, and here it is on the end of a Q-tip. It's got a little bit of this sort of burgundy color on the outside. That's the characteristic distinction of it. Um, there's also a larva. So this is the adult, the nymph, and the larva, which are really teeny tiny. Um, this is in uh, a nymph. Uh, and any of these two, the nymphs and the adults can bite you. And when they bite, they actually, you know, they, they suck blood and they get engorged. So this is a nymph um, that has bitten somebody and got engorged. It looks, this is ahead of a pin. These are really, really tiny and they're really hard to pick up, especially if you've got, you know, if it's in a, more, in a hairier area. But these are, these are, these are not easy to pick up. Not, not, not at all. They're hard to detect. So you can't just look when you're doing a tick check. You want to actually rub your hand over, over your body when you're showering, and just see if there's anything that, anything that that sticks out a little bit, because that might be the only way you'll detect some of these, um, because they're small. Um, and uh, a lot of questions about dog tick versus deer tick. Again. Um, these are the deer tick down here with that red burgundy color. The dog tick doesn't have any of the red. It has some white markings, has some funny white markings. And here's a deer tick. This one, you can see the color nicely. On um, This is the male, the female, um, the nymph, and the larva. Um, and here it's, again, the deer tick versus the dog tick. The dog tick is bigger, but honestly, I mean, yeah, I don't know. If you, if you find one of these one of these critters on you, it's going to be pretty hard to say this is the dog tick versus the deer tick because they're both, you know, I and maybe I, I I find it challenging. You see some white on this now. The other problem is by the time when you're when you're checking for these things, they're engorged, okay? Because typically you're not going to find one when it, it's very difficult to find one very early on. But the bigger they get, the easier it is for you to find them. So if you find something that looks like this, it's pretty hard to tell that this used to look like that because when they're engorged, they look very, very different. Uh, and this, I just want to sort of gross you out. This is a female with an egg mass. Um, this is what the, this is part of the reproductive cycle of these uh, critters and explains why we have so many ticks around. Uh, again, this is an engorged deer tick and engorged dog tick. Dog ticks are bigger. Um, but again, it's hard to distinguish from their markings. However, if you're really good, you can see on a dog tick, it's got the white markings, these funny white markings. Now, of course, the challenge is when one of these is embedded in your skin and you're trying to remove it, um, you're probably going to squish its head and lose the markings. So um, I actually, I don't place that much, uh, I don't trust myself to be able to identify a tick. Um, when you find a tick, you should save it, put it in a little, a uh, little bottle uh, and save it. And you can actually even send it to the tick lab and have them find out, um, uh, have them tell you what, what kind of tick it was and whether it was infected. Okay, this is the Lone Star tick. Again, this is the one that causes that alpha-gal uh, syndrome, allergic reactions to red meat. The Lone Star, it looks like the female has a Lone Star, making it easy to identify. The male just has a bunch of these funny markings here. Um, Again, relatively rare, but it's happening. And I know somebody on in the audience actually has alpha-gal syndrome and asked me to talk about that. Um, so I want to step back and, and do a little ecology uh, lesson so we can better understand what we're up against with this. Um, deer, the reason we have so many, um, so many ticks, so much tick-borne disease and so many ticks is because we have so many deer. These are deeply inter interconnected. The abundance and distribution of deer ticks is related to the size of the deer population. So anytime you're at somewhere where there's a lot of deer, you're going to find a lot of ticks. Um, and that's because over 90% of adult ticks feed on deer. Uh, and then again, in each tick after they feed on a deer will drop off and lay 3,000 eggs. Uh, so that's again, that's a lot of, lot of, lot of eggs, a lot of ticks. Adult ticks also feed on possums, raccoons, coyotes, skunks, um, 
uh, all sorts of little animals, chipmunks, all sorts of little things. But the ticks cannot be maintained in significant numbers by feeding on those animals. So we wouldn't have the numbers that we have if we didn't have uh, the high, high density of deer. Um, so basically, the deer, if you've got deer in your yard or if there's deer in an area where you're going to be, assume that there are ticks there because the deer transport these blood engorged female ticks into the property uh, where they then lay their eggs. Um, and then that starts to cycle. Those eggs will then turn into larva ticks and those will feed on, on other animals. So each year, each deer each year supports half a million new larval ticks. Uh, opossums are actually good. I haven't seen any opossums up here, but they actually are one of the few animals that kill ticks. Foxes, oops, foxes are actually very good, I guess when they're not rabid, um, but because they eat the white-footed mice, which are also critical in the life cycle of the uh, ticks. Um, coyotes kill foxes or scare them away, but foxes are good. And there are certain kind of plants that actually are, are like incubators for ticks because they provide an ideal environment for ticks. They create a humidity um, that helps them quest and mate. And uh, so Japanese barbary is also sort of part of uh, important for the life cycle of these ticks. I mentioned that because these, well, these are will all inform what you can do to make your property uh, safer. Um, so it's important to know that the 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 reservoir for the diseases for Lyme is not the deer, but it's the mice. The mice, the mice and chipmunks and these small small meso mammals and birds, they actually carry the disease. They're infected. It doesn't make them sick for reasons I have no idea why, but they carry the disease. And then when a tick bites that animal, the tick gets infected from the mice. And then when that, an when that tick bites another animal, it spreads it. So the tick is the vector, but the source of the disease, the reservoir, are these tiny animals, mice and chipmunks. Uh, so another way of controlling Animal, or controlling Lyme disease on your property or in other areas is to control the population of these animals. Now, deer do not carry the disease, but they're critical for sustaining the life cycle. Okay, that's where the final, that's where they meet and they, uh, you know, they, they, they reproduce on the deer. Okay, so a little more about deer ticks. We've mentioned that they need a damp, humid, and humid environment to survive. And so they're usually found in wooded areas and wooded edges. Leaf litter, when you're in the fall, when you're raking the leaves, um, there's going to be a lot of ticks in there because they, they can only survive in moisture, also in low ground cover. They don't survive in open fields or areas without shrubbery nearby. Um, and what happens to them is after they have attached to a host for a few days to weeks, they drop off. They spend a couple of weeks to months digesting a blood meal. They molt and they re repeat the process. So they have three meals in their lifetime. So I'm just going to walk you through the life cycle, the two-year life cycle of a tick. They start from the eggs. Okay, so the eggs are hatching right now. It's spring, starting to hatch. Okay. And they, as they hatch, they turn into a larva. The larva then needs its first meal. They will, they will eat off of a mouse or a bird or a chipmunk, any little tiny little critter. It's small animals because that's their, these are only larvae. Um, so the larva will bite one of these guys, die, uh, have a blood meal, drop off, digest all of that, molt, and then turn into, in the springtime, turn into a nymph. So now we're back springtime. So this nymph now is here. If, if this larva bit a mouse that was infected with Lyme or anaplasmosis, this nymph now is infected with Lyme or, or anaplasmosis. Okay, so then the, this, this nymph has a good chance of already being infected if these mice are carrying the disease. Okay, so now it's spring, the nymphs are out. The nymphs are now looking for their second blood meal. And so if they see a deer, a squirrel, a fox, or you or I, um, they will bite whatever they can get, get, get into. They will hang on for a couple of days, drop off when they're, when they're full. They'll, molt, they'll digest that, uh, that blood meal. They will molt. 
and then in the fall they will they will emerge as an adult tick, male or female. And then now they're ready for their third meal. And again, and that will either most likely be a deer, but again, if they find us, it's us or a fox. And then uh, they will stay on for two to three days, finish their meal, drop off. And they'll, again, most likely on a deer, they'll drop off. And then the adult, will, the adult female would then lay her 3,000 eggs um, in, in this spring. Okay, and so here we are in the spring. So there are eggs out there now, which are no harm to us. And there are nymphs and the nymphs are, again, the chance of that if, if these guys are infected, there's a good chance that nymph is infected. Again, about half of them are infected. So right now we're right here in our cycle. Um, and this, this just shows you the seasonal activity of adults, nymphs and larvae. So we are right around here. The nymphs are starting to emerge. There's still a little bit of adults. Some adults who didn't find a meal before, they're still out there. So they're still, um, a, you know, some, if they didn't have a successful uh, meal, there are some that hang around. Basically, if it's, if it's not freezing out, um, if it's not freezing or it's not incredibly dry, hot and dry, uh, the ticks are out. And most of them are diseased. Now, things you need to know about ticks is they are blood-sucking parasites and they have infrared sensors. So um, they are very good at finding us. Um, what they do, this is a leaf of grass. They will stand, this is called questing. They basically stand on that, reach out, and they have sensors um, that, that will, they, they can sense the vibration of your foot, of your, uh, foot. And they can also smell the carbon dioxide or a sudden uh, rise in temperature as you're getting close. So you don't see them because, again, some of these are, you know, smaller than the head of a pen. Um, but they actually are sensing you and they're perching just waiting for you to go by. Um, and so when it, when it sees an animal pa passing by, it reaches out with its legs that have, that have, little, oops, that have little hooks on them to grab and we don't feel their bite because they actually inject a little anesthetic when they bite. So you, you do not feel us and they don't, and there's no itch when they bite because of what they, what they uh, eject. Um, and again, they know where to hide so we can't see them and they don't come off easily. So we are definitely disadvantaged. And this, I just want to show you, this is a tick questing on a leaf and I'm just going to go, you can see what happened. That's, that's skin. That's somebody's skin reaches out, catches on, and there, there he is. Typically, they don't actually um, uh, settle down right away. They'll typically wander around your body for about 12 hours or so until they figure out where they're going to bite, uh, where they're going to, you know, wh where's a good spot to lodge. And so you do have time. They won't, you know, they're not going to immediately dig in. So you have time. So if you, after you've been outdoors, within a few hours, if you take a shower, you can actually wash them off. Um, so that's important to know. Now, so we just remember, ticks are very clever. We can't see them. They sense us. We can't feel them bite. They hide where we can't find them, and they don't come off easily. So um, you've got to you've, you've got to be clever to avoid them. Um, you can reduce your exposure through landscaping. I mentioned this uh, barbary is a particularly bad bad thing. So if you have any of this in your yard or areas, just cut it down. Get rid of it. Uh, on your lawn or your backyard. Most ticks are found in the transition area between the lawn and the woods, and that's because it's moist there. Um, mowing helps to reduce uh, ticks in there, there. The more you can increase light and reduce dampness, the fewer ticks you'll have. Putting wood chips, uh, mulch, or a gravel barrier um, between your, where your yard area is and the woods um, will help. Because uh, the because the ticks won't migrate across it, and they don't they're, they're not going to do that. If you have stone walls, remember they those shelter mice, and the mice carry ticks. So if you have stone walls, clear away any brush. Um, I know uh, there's a, a lot of controversy about pesticides. Um, there, pesticides are toxic to um, they 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 work. They kill ticks. They're also toxic to vertebrates and and invertebrates. They all kill pollinators, whether they call it a green pesticide or not. They all uh, kill pollinators. Um, there are ways. Um, uh, there are there are companies that get, take take precautions to make sure that they cause minimal damage. But um, it it is a 
challenging solution, a challenging problem. There's some, I've seen some botanical pesticides, um, uh, some have said this, that it's, it's effective. I have no idea if that's true or not. Um, um, uh, somebody wanted me to talk about pets. I'm not, I'm not a veterinarian. So I looked up, there's a very good website, the Baker Institute at Cornell that has a lot of information. Um, tick, Lyme disease is very bad for dogs. It does the same things for dogs as it does for humans. Um, and what you do, one thing you don't have to worry so much is if the dog, if a tick bites a dog uh, and gets engorged and it drops off the pet when it's in the house, that that's not going to survive or lay eggs in the house generally because the air is generally too dry. They like moisture. Um, um, you can protect your pets with tick repellent, uh, a caricide, and, uh, and there is a Lyme vaccine for dogs. Um, and again, I plead ignorance on the specifics of that. Um, cats, it looks like, even though theoretically a cat can get infected, apparently it's never been seen in a cat outside of a laboratory setting. So that's reassuring. It just seems to be our, the dogs are at risk. Um, and this seems to be some of the protection things. Again, I would talk to your uh, veterinarian about, you know, what's appropriate for um, appropriate and safe for your dog. Um, other ways to protect yourself uh, is, um, again, dressing, uh, dressing for success, using repellents. Again, we talked about checking for ticks, removing ticks, and protecting your, lo your lawn. Um, dressing appropriately is really important. Um, this is not the way to do it, but these are, you can actually buy, um, there's a brand, Bugs Away, um, that actually, they're, they're clo they're, it's like regular clothes, but it's pre-treated with this chemical called permethrin, uh, that when, when dry is, is, I just can't say it's harmless, but it's, 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 it has, it doesn't seem to be, a, a much of a problem, um, and, and when it's wet, it's rare. when it's uh, when when you're uh, using the liquid form of it, it's actually very very toxic to cats and a lot of other uh, and, and yourself. But when it's dry, it seems to be much safer. Um, so uh, the other important thing to do is when you're when you're outside, you want to wear white or light colors so that you can you might be you have a chance of seeing a tick crawling on you. Remember, ticks will typically uh, they'll land on your they land on your your shoes or your socks or your pant legs and then they'll wander around they'll wander they wander up and then they'll try to get in at your waist um if they've hit your pants so if you can if you're wearing white or light colors you have a chance of seeing them before they they get up there um, um wear long pants not shorts wear long sleeves just and and if you're wearing something that is that is not you have open skin then you want to spray Spray that skin with DEET or another EPA-approved um, repellent. Um, tuck your shirt into your pants and your pants into your socks. That basically doesn't give the uh, – if, if your clothes are soaked with permetrin, then what will happen is the tick, if it gets on you, it will not like the permetrin. It will try to escape, and so it will stop climbing up your clothes and drop off. Um, and so you just want to make it hard for that permethrin to get in and find your warm, moist skin. Um, and so use repellent on, and if you don't have permethrin to treat your clothes, you can actually apply rep, uh, repellent to your clothes, and then again, that will discourage them from, from, from getting on you. Um, uh, uh, and, and also wearing pre-treated socks is a really good idea because, um, again, the, the, most of the, most of the ticks get on you from your feet, your socks, your lower legs. So if you have, uh, if you, if you protect your feet with socks, you're good. Uh, avoid open toed shoes or sandals. Um, they also like to get in when you're doing a tick check. If you do wear them, look between your, your toes because they like to get in between those, uh, spots. Um, uh, and again, ticks, if, if putting your clothes in the washing machine um, will not get rid of, of, of ticks. They can survive water. They can survive a hot wash, but they cannot survive long in a hot dryer. So the best thing, you come in, if you want to kill the ticks on your clothes, throw them in a dryer before you wash them, okay, just so you can kill, kill anything that's on your clothes before you throw your dirty clothes in with the rest of your uh, dirty clothes. Okay, also spray shoes and your clothes with permethrin. Um, uh, you can, 
I, I tried uh, spraying some of my own clothes with permethrin. It's a real pain in the neck. You can do it. Um, you know, you, you've got to really protect yourself from inhaling it. Those, it's not. It's not good to breathe that in when it's wet. Um, you can actually, there's a company called Insect Shield, you can go online and find them, and they'll actually send you an envelope, a big envelope, and you can you can send whatever clothes you want to get pre-treated, have your own, mail it to them, they'll pre-treat it professionally and send it right back to you. It's not terribly expensive, um, and and once they have treated it, it'll last about 70, 70 washings, and, so, uh, and it's effective through 70 washings. If you do your own system where you just spray it, you just spray your clothes with this, um, and this is me having, you know, spraying my shoes and some clothes. You got to really protect yourself when you're doing that. Um, uh, it, it, it only lasts six, seven washings when you do this. So I don't think, I think that's not really worth the bother or the risk, but getting, getting either buying pre-treated clothes or getting your clothes treated by this company really works well. Um, tick repellents are, are effective when used. You can actually, um, this is a nice little thing. You can get some little wipes um, and to carry with you so that if you're somewhere and you don't, you know, and suddenly you're, you realize you're in a tick infested area um, you're, or you, you need to go off the path, um, you can just wipe yourself with that. Um, there are a lot of different tick repellents. Um, you only apply them to your exposed skin or clothing. Don't put, you know, if you're wearing pants, don't put, don't put the repellent under the pants. That's not a good idea. Just anything like if you, so if you're wearing long sleeves, you know, put it on your hand or if you're wearing, you know, anything that's exposed. Um, DEET is the most effective um, um, uh, product to, to repel ticks. And, and there are different concentrations. They all work. The difference between the concentrations is how long the protection lasts. Uh, so. Uh, if you're going to be out for a long time and you won't be able to reapply, you want to use a stronger percent, a percentage deed um, or use a lesser. Uh, uh, um, there are other brands. This, is, uh, this, this has some toxicities. It's uh, somewhat of a neurotoxin. So people, a lot of people um, are hesitant to use this. Um, and it also uh, is a solvent. So you don't, if you put it on plastics, you put it on your shoes or any of your hunting stuff, uh, it, can, it can damage that. So... Um, picaridin is a nice alternative. It's not quite as effective. doesn't Doesn't last quite as long. It's derived from pepper. Doesn't harm plastics or fabrics. Um, it appears to be pretty safe. So it, there's a lot of uh, products uh, have picaridin in it. Um, let me see. I've, um, I think Repel. I think uh, I think this one. Oh no, so, sorry, Sawyer. Sawyer is prepared. Anyway, you'll find there's another product that is called this IR three five three five. It says it's relatively non toxic. It's not clear how effective it is. EPA says it's okay, but I think it's, it's some sources say it's less effective than D. Seems to be safer than uh, than than D. Oil of lemon eucalyptus is another plant based, uh, supposed to be somewhat effective. Um, but for shorter periods of time, um, and again, citronella, essential, other essential oils uh, seem to be ineffective. Um, with tick repellents, you want to apply apply it on your again your shoe socks and pant legs. Avoid avoid high concentration products on just on your skin, especially children. Try to again try to apply it to your clothes instead of your skin. And use just enough. Putting an extra layer doesn't doesn't do you any better or long longer lasting. Just um, just use just what you need. Again, Prometrin works pretty well. Um, and uh, you'll find combined products of, out there. And this is probably not a good idea because of the reapplication. You have to reapply sunscreen every two hours. And um, if you do that with insect repellent, you'll be probably having too high doses of that. So you're better off to, if you want both sun protection and, and repellent, you, what you should do is apply your sun protection first, let that dry, wait 10 to 15 minutes, and then apply the insect repellent. Okay. Okay. Tick checks. We addressed it a little bit, but now that you have some background, uh, what you want to do is thoroughly inspect your body. Um, use your fingertips so you're feeling, not just looking. Do, do, do your scalp, hairline, arms, armpits. Um, just go everywhere, you know, and it, it just doesn't take long. I mean, you'll get, you kind of get used to doing this kind of a, a scan when you're taking a shower. Again, when you're shampooing, just try to, just try to feel your scalp to see if there's any, any bumps. 
Um, and again, shower as soon as you can after, you're, after you've been out in the woods or potentially explo- exposed. Um, if you find a tick, it's really important that you remove it properly. Because if this tick is infected, the bacteria are sitting up here, like in its body. Uh, and if you upset it, if you squeeze it or you, you know, light it with a match or do some of the other crazy things I've seen on, on the Internet, um, what will happen is the, 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 you'll actually squeeze and squeeze all of that uh, disease, all of the diseased uh, uh, bacteria into yourself. So you want to make sure you pinch it from below at, around its head and pull it up directly up. You don't want to twist it. You don't want to squish it again. You don't want to, you don't want to squeeze the content of its belly into you because it's got a direct line to your blood. Okay. So that's really, really important. So don't squeeze, crush, or puncture. Ignore anything that talks about uh, anything other than lifting it straight out is, 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 is really dangerous. You can, um, but actually the easiest way is to get a very fine tooth tweezer. And you can also, uh, they have these kick spoons that work on the big ticks, but it's really hard to, they don't work so well on the nymphs because you're so small. Um, and uh, well, one, I guess one last thing I want to mention is um, the, if you, if you have been bitten by a tick, you, let's say you find a tick on you and it's engorged, um, you can actually take an antibiotic, a- antibiotic uh, right away and that will actually uh, strongly reduce your risk of getting getting um, uh, getting Lyme disease, uh, but it depends. It's the, so, the sooner the better. Um, so the long if if the t- the tick the tick has to have been attached to you for over a day, um, and 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 if you catch it within uh, within 72 hours of removing the tick. Uh, you've got a pretty good chance that that with taking one pill, you will actually want this one one pill of the doxycycline that you will actually prevent uh, yourself from getting Lyme disease. So there's another reward, you know, for being vigilant um, that finding it early, removing it ASAP, uh, letting your doctor know, um, uh, and and getting that one pill. It's so much better than having a full course of uh, of antibiotics. Um, which has side effects like you know uh, you can't you can't really go out in the sun and uh, so anyway this this is a great thing to know. There's no vaccine. Um, somebody asked about that. It's an interesting story, really interesting story about why there's no vaccine. Where there was one, it was very effective, um, but it's kind of lost in the court of public opinion. Um, and I just want to. Uh, close with this slide here. There are things you these are a, a review of things you can do to reduce your exposure to tick-borne diseases. This summarizes things we discussed. Uh, any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Cole. That was um, a lot of really amazing information. And we've been watching the questions here. You answered a lot of the ones that folks had sent in. Um, here's a question. Uh, does swimming have the same effect as showering for removing ticks crawling on you? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I would think so. I would think it would help. I would think it would help, um, especially if I were, you know, this is a challenge. Like people who do a lot of outdoor camping, like Maine guides, you're out in the islands and there's no shower there. It's, it's challenging. I would think if I, if I were in that situation, what I would do is when I'm in the water, I would just, you know, do things. Or if you have, find some seaweed, if you're out, you know, out on one of the islands, you know, and just, um, uh, or bring a little one of those little loofah things um, and just brush that along, you know, along your body. I, it's it's certainly better than not showering. Uh, and I, I appreciate that there are times when you can't take a shower. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, is there uh, any prophylactic that is safe for children under eight years old? You know, I'm not a pediatrician. Uh, I think there are some alternatives to doxycycline. They don't like using doxycycline in children because I think it does something to the teeth. Um, 
Uh, so there are some penicillin related uh, drugs that I believe I, the answer is, I think, I think so, but I check on it. I'm not a pediatrician. Um, I can't imagine why there wouldn't, wouldn't be, um, but I don't know. Um, I think you mentioned this a little bit. Any, uh, we had a couple of questions about just uh, recommendations of uh, tick proofing lawns. You mentioned removing, you know, keeping your grass short, removing any brush piles. Um, uh, yeah. Um, here. So here are some things. Uh, make uh, so let's see you can removing barberry um, you can also introduce or encourage species that eat ticks uh, some of the birds chickens and you know turkeys and eat some ticks now that's that's actually a two-edged sword because they eat ticks but they also feed ticks um, and also when you and also when you're feeding them the, you know, whatever, if you're feeding those those birds, that actually attra attracts mice, and then the mice are the reservoir for it. So this one, I don't, the jury's not out on that. Again, spraying chemical insecticide to control ticks. Again, I personally don't recommend that as a gardener, um, but, um, but I know that people do that. Um, biological and natural control. Um, oh, and tick tubes. That's the other thing you can do are tick tubes. Um, and uh, I forgot to mention that. I actually brought uh, some things to demonstrate how you make a tick tube. Um, tick tubes are basically, you can buy them um, and you can also make them. Basically what tick tubes are, you have, you get a piece of cotton, you get a ball of cotton. You know, it's like a dollar for like, you know, a hundred balls of these little cotton. And you basically spray them with this permethrin. Permethrin, is that it? Yep, there we are. Permethrin, trying to find my camera. Um, or you basically, you put some permethrin in a container and you put a whole bunch of balls in there. You make sure you get a little permethrin. And then what you do is you save any of your toilet paper or paper towel, cardboard. And then once, once this is sprayed and dried, you let it dry, you stuff it in here. So now you have a little contain a little thing that has a uh, permethrin soaked cotton ball and you put that out in areas around your yard um, at the right seasons and now is a good season basically it's when the when the little um, um, mice and other animals are building their nest what they will do they will find they will find this now these now these now will contain permethrin which kills ticks they will actually put these fibers in their nest and so this will actually kill the ticks on those animals. And by doing, by, by basically, you're basically, it's like putting flea collars on all of the ticks, on all of the mice. Um, so this is, this has actually been shown to be pretty effective, but you have to put a lot of them out. I forget if it's like every uh, 30 feet or so, but you know, but it, they're real easy to make. Um, and, and you have to like replace them like every three or six months or so. Um, and you put them in a tube here so that cats and other, you know, uh, cats don't get at that because theoretically um, permethrin is not, not good for cats. Again, it's pretty much the wet stuff, but again, you don't, you don't, you don't put it out there until it's dry. Uh, some people recommend spraying the um, cardboard with you know any kind of paint just so it doesn't deteriorate um but anyway i, I do a lot of that and it's just in in the area where i'm around a lot um and it just helps to ensure that uh the ticks that that there's going to be fewer ticks in the area where you're say gardening or walking or getting the mail you know and it's, it's pretty easy to do you can buy tick tubes too um there and you can also get the um I think they sell them in most, like most of the hardware stores uh, sell them. There's also a rodent bait box, uh, and that all, that also has been shown to be effective. It's pretty pricey as a thing, um, um, and basically the mice go in and they sort of get rubbed with this uh, tick killer. Um, and so you're basically treating treating. And these these don't actually hurt the mice or, or the ro they, they doesn't 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 do any harm to the animals, it just hit, it, it kills the ticks on the mice or the other rodents. So that's a good, that's a good thing that people can do. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Right on, thank you. Um, I just wanna, it's 
just three minutes after seven, um, Dr. Cole, I think you said you could stay for a little bit longer. So for anybody um, who wants to stick around, we'll answer a few more questions. Yeah. Oh, I see one question. Somebody said their doctor would yeah. not preempt preemptively treat for Lyme disease. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Um, I guess I can, you can always get a second. Anybody is entitled to get a second opinion. Lyme disease is, you know, it's, it's a hard diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis and not everybody is comfortable um, or, or as skilled uh, in, in, in detecting it. The good thing here in Maine, um, what you can do is actually instead of getting a second opinion, you can ask for a referral to infectious disease doctors. Maine has some of the best infectious disease uh, specialists in the country when it comes to Lyme disease. Um, so we actually have some of the leading experts in the country here. So if there's any question, you can always ask, um, do you mind just running it by uh, an infectious disease specialist? And often it helps um, if you're seeing a doctor or uh, a healthcare provider who is not um, a, that familiar with Lyme disease um, or other tick-borne diseases, it helps to just remind them that you live in a tick-infested area where there's a high rate. Just reminding them that um, you know that you're it, it, again if you live in the mid-coast area or have been have been hiking or doing something outdoors, um, just let them let them know um and the other thing that also helps is whenever again whenever i get people sending me a picture of a rash saying what is it mark just on your skin get the sharpie a little black you know a, a fine point sharpie make mark mark that take a picture of it and then a few hours later if this lyme disease is going to be growing and then take another you know then mark that next ring take a picture you got the date and time that would really help with the diagnosis because often by the time you go in to see the person, the rash is not there anymore because that rash, it'll get bigger and then all of a sudden it'll go away. And then, you, you know, it's like, what rash? Um, so just take pictures and use, use, use you know, you, you, you know, look at the time because there's really, there's, I don't think there's any other rash that does that. Uh, so that's pretty much pathognomonic for Lyme disease. Excellent. Um, here's a question that I'm actually kind of curious about. Um, if you remove a tick and a piece of its body remains in your skin, is that piece of the tick still able to transmit Lyme? Uh, no, no. What you so and that's not that uncommon because it's it's the pictures made it look like it's really easy to remove a tick. It's really hard to remove a tick. And it's especially hard to remove it from children who may be screaming at the top of their lungs, which my daughter did when I was removing a tick from her when she was younger. Um, it's really difficult. Um, and it's, it's kind of disgusting and it's hard. They're so small and getting under them is, is hard. So it's, it's not that uncommon to leave something behind. Um, the, 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 the disease is actually in the back part of the, let me find a slide with a picture of these lovely critters. Um, the, 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 the infected part of the infection is basically in their gut. So if you can actually, but once you've removed that, um, it, it, the, it, it, if, if you, you either already squirted the contents of its infection into you during the process, or you, you either did or didn't, the head is not where the virus sits. It's, it's that process. So make sure when you're removing it, you don't, you don't squeeze it. I can't seem to find my pictures of ticks here anymore. Well, anyway, oh, well, here's a picture of a tick. You know, the, engorge, the, the, the bacteria uh, spirochetes are all going to be located over here. They're not, they're in the gut. So as long as you don't manage to squeeze from the top and squeeze it in, the head is not where it is. So that's not going to, I don't think that's going to make much difference. Gotcha. You do want to disinfect the skin um, and wash your hands. If you can actually uh, having a fine tuned tweezers and try to pull out as much as you can, that would be, that would be useful. Um, I know in the past I've uh, sometimes done a dab of um, alcohol. Will that uh, help cause it to kind of drop off or it's really getting at it with the, the tweezers is the no, main thing? No, no, don't, 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 don't do, I would not put, I would not put out, you mean before you try pulling it off? Yes. I wouldn't do that because you don't want to upset it. Because if you do something that upsets it, like putting a, light, a lit match, you'll, it'll vomit. Basically, it will vomit the entire contents or the equivalent of vomiting everything in its gut 
into your bloodstream. So you want to keep that thing happy. You don't want to upset it. You just want to sneak up on it and remove it as quickly as you can from below. But I would, you now after you've done that, uh, disinfect the skin, you know, and wash your hands. I mean, you know, but, but it's, it's this process here. Don't, don't try anything, you know, funny because that will just backfire. You don't want an upset tick on you. Okay. Sneak up on it. Sneak up on it. Yes. Um, <laughs> the element of surprise. <laughs> we have a, a fun question here. Somebody asked, please detail exactly what you, Dr. Cole, now wear while mushroom hunting. Well, <laughs> so I wish I could have my outfit on in person. Um, so I have a whole range Um I, and I also wanted to mention, de- depending on the weather, there's and also there's a set of clothes. There's a brand. It's called what is it? Ry- it's called Rhino Skin, and it's a weave of fabric that is so thin that nothing nothing can get through. So if it's a cool day, I will actually wear my Rhino Skin underneath. Um, and then and again uh, and then on my outside later is is always um, uh, where is it? um like it's it's the the clothes they sell in the fishing department at LL Bean. My my sophisticated daughter is finds that terribly amusing that her mother shops in the fishing department at LL Bean. <laughs> but because that's where they sell LL Bean sells the pre-treated clothes, and so they have um, they have a, a variety of of uh, long sleeve shirts that are very thin. Um, and I actually like those because they're they don't, they're not they're not tight to your skin, so you don't have the permethrin t- contact with your skin. But ideally, I like wearing something like this as an underlayer if it's if it's cool. And then I will have my outer layer always be something that is permethrin then soaked. And again, I try to minimize the contact with of the permethrin um, treated clothes with my skin. It's not, it's, it's, it's because I spend a lot of time outdoors. Um, um, so if I can, I'll wear something underneath my permethrin layer. But I, I basically have several layers of, of clothes, including a jacket, um, again, depending on the temperature. So my outer layer is always, uh, always protected. And my pants, it's just the, uh, the regular, like, uh, I think I showed a picture of some of the typical hiking pants. I also have a pair of, uh, thin sweatpants, um, these kind of pants, I have a variety of these kind of like lightweight cloth pants. Um, and also I have some other nylon uh, pants that I basically I sent into um, the company to treat. Um, so you can get whatever. And, and then I also I have a hat, a cloth hat that um, I, I spray. I No, I sent that in to get treated. And um, I also have gaiters that sometimes if I'm only going to I'm making a quick trip you know, uh, my my garden is on the roof. If I'm making a trip uh, on the roof and there's only short things, I will just wear, they have these gaiters, tick gaiters, um, and you can just put these on your on your legs. And so if, I'm, if I know I'm only going to be going in a place where there's grass, yay high, I'll wear shoes and socks that were treated and this, and then I won't care. But that's only if I'm just going to be in my garden. So it just it just depends, but all I just make sure I'm completely I'm completely protected. You don't want to, you know. I did. I was really sick. I was pretty much out for a month. Um, it was, um, and it's not, you know, it, it, it's it, these. It's I think COVID maybe has made people aware that a lot of these diseases that are considered not not fatal are still really have a lot of uh, morbidity associated. The treatment, um, doxycycline. It's highly effective, um, um, but the longer you take it, you get, you know, it causes, it causes some reflux, esophagitis, it causes nausea, some nausea, and the longer you take it, and if you're on a higher dose, if you have two diseases at once and you have to take a double dose, um, and you can't go out in the sun at all. I mean, like serious. Uh, so you know, it's it's uh, and it takes it takes a while to get to get fully back back to normal. So you know, you get this, yeah, you'll be fine, but you kind of like lost a month. You know? mm-hmm. Um, we had a a question. Do you know? There's no. You mentioned that there was no vaccines currently. Do you know if any yeah. vaccines trying to be developed for any of these diseases? 
let me tell you the story about the vaccine. So this vaccine um, was actually was again highly highly effective. It was approved by the FDA. Um, it did really well in trials. And what happened is some people were reporting that they had arthritis um, uh, with they were uh, here. Some, some people were reporting that they had arthritis, just like in some of the COVID vaccines in Europe, some people are reporting blood clots. Um, now, when you have a new vaccine out, you have to, anything that gets reported goes into a vaccine registry. So there were cases of arthritis in people who had gotten the vaccine. But again, if I asked how many people right now are feeling some joint pain, I bet a lot of hands would go up, you know. Um, so all of those, when, when they actually looked at the studies and when they actually did studies to see was it a higher rate of, of arthritis among people on the vaccine versus not, it turned out there was absolutely no difference. So there were good studies saying it didn't, there was it, the, the arthritis, it just happened to be the people that take this happened to get arthritis, but there was no difference in vaccine uses versus not. However, the media got into, got onto this. Um, there was, and it was like a feeding frenzy. Um, and so basically it lost in the court of public opinion. And so the vaccine, so there was this perception that it caused arthritis, whereas in fact, arthritis is one of the, you know, one of the, you know, uh, sort of dreaded complications of if you miss the diagnosis, you can get arthritis from this and it's pretty serious and it doesn't always go back to normal. So it's funny that this happened to be um, what happened, but, um, and no, nobody wants to go back into that space. This is kind of the end of vaccines um, because, you have a, a vaccine that actually was effective and safe, and because of the way we monitor monitor them, um, that we don't have a control group when we're doing a vaccine, um, it's uh, it made it made it very challenging. So I don't I'm not aware of there being another vaccine. Somebody said I heard somewhere there may be one being developed in Europe, but honestly I don't I'm not I'm not aware of that. Um, and I mean, maybe after COVID vaccine, maybe maybe the sentiment will will change. Um. Well, thank you. It's it's 15 minutes after the hour, um, so I think we're gonna end it there. I just want to thank Dr. Cole again for sharing just a tremendous amount of information with us. Um, like she said, we will have these slides um, available. Um, I'll be. Uh, putting those on the CELT website and including a link to those in the follow-up email tomorrow with the recording. So thank you again, Dr. Cole. Great. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, it's a really big topic, but I'm glad that we were um, able to learn more tonight together. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a Thank great you. Bye-bye everyone. Have a good night.